Dr. Hyman, thank you so much for joining us here again on Health Connection. Our topic this time, sugar and cancer, does one fuel the other? And I'm going to ask you a question that the answer may seem obvious, but I think your answer is going to prove that it's not so obvious, a definition. What is cancer? Cancer are cells that have lost their regulatory mechanisms, and so they don't know when to stop growing and reproducing. They take over and continue to multiply and then start the process of shedding cells that can spread to other parts of the body. And there's no such thing as one thing that's cancer. There's a, it's a range of, of similar diseases that have this in common. Is that correct? That is the common thread, but any cell in the body can become cancerous. They all look differently. They all have different natural histories about how fast they might grow, uh, how far they spread, and what organs they spread to. And then within each type of cancer, there's a huge spectrum from the slow and indolent and don't bother you kinds of problems to the very fast and aggressive and get you if you don't get going quickly at okay. the other end. All right. Tying to our segment title, recent reports indicate a possible connection between the consumption of sugar and cancer. And of additional concern, there are reports that, that are now coming to light that for 50 years, the sugar industry has been aware of a possible link between sugar and cancer and also with heart disease. How concerning is this information and is it surprising to you? Well, I think there's two aspects to these recent reports. Uh, one is the, the suggestion that there's been a cover-up and I'm not going to go there uh, other than to say it's never good for information in the scientific community to get suppressed. Uh, that's happened potentially here and we know in other places with other possible cancer-causing uh, things like cigarettes, etc. But the issue with this link to cancer is the rediscovery that it appears that some cancer cells can really ramp up their metabolism of sugar and go on, on overdrive with very, very fast growth rates. And that effect has uh, long been postulated and seems to occur in a few types of cancer. All that being said, every nutrient in our body that we take in goes through sugar as its uh, process to its final product. So there's nothing magic about sugar itself. So the most convincing evidence is that sugar feeds obesity and we know that obesity is a very different story than just sugar. Obesity changes the hormonal balances in both men and women and may be a huge risk factor over time for certain cancers to develop. Uh, there's frequently not just one factor that leads to a cancer developing. So obviously not all people who are overweight develop cancer. So additional environmental exposures or behavioral exposures like cigarettes, uh, they all add together plus the huge impact of your family tree, uh, and especially if you have one of the defined genetic mutations that increases the risk of certain cancers. Okay. You touched on this, but let's amplify. Explain the connection. What is it about sugar consumption that increases the risk of cancer? Well, I'm going to backtrack with a little more history. Doing research on nutritional impacts on disease, cancer or otherwise, is extremely hard to do and do well because we in America and probably everywhere in the world are affected by food fads in, in tremendous uh, penetration into the community. So if you give a controlled diet to a, a research group, it's likely that the control group is going to say, oh, I saw that diet on the internet, I'm doing that too. And so the data gets skewed. So the only way to do precise nutritional research is to isolate people and control every morsel of food that they take in and to do it for an extended period of time. When I was in training way back when, uh, we actually had a clinical research center where mostly college students lived there and every morsel of food supposedly was provided by the research kitchen. But those were studies that had a few months duration, a semester basically. And so long-term studies, they're, they're impossible to do. And so uh, we have to look at population studies and say, 
you know, here's Northeast Texas with an average sugar consumption of so much and an average cancer rate of so much, and then use all kinds of statistical analyses to try to imply a connection, and then apply that to lab research, uh, like this recently uncovered data where the, the metabolism of cells may be hugely ramped up by sugar, uh, and try to make it all fit. So I think sugar isn't a simple story, and I think that by itself, uh, having a high sugar intake probably is not a cancer risk. But if you continue with a high sugar intake and get overweight or obese, then your risks definitely go up. Okay. Are there specific types of cancer to which this connection may be stronger or more impactful? Uh, that data is, uh, is maturing fairly rapidly. Uh, of course, breast cancer is the, the one with the best uh, data set in history of connecting obesity with uh, increased rates of not only a development of the first cancer, but if you're cured of your first cancer but don't change your body mass index, the rate of that cancer's recurrence is higher if, you have a, uh, if you're overweight or obese. Okay. There are many different forms of sugar. Are some types, such as the sugar we find in soft drinks, uh, sugar in baked goods, just as examples, potentially more of a concern than other types of sugar? Uh, it appears that they help fuel obesity in different rates. But again, these molecules all get metabolized and converted and then converted back to a storage product of some type. And so it's, I think, the net balance of these many factors. It's uh, total caloric intake, it's percent fat, especially animal fat, and it is your body mass index, coupled with all these other uncontrollable things like your family history. Okay, all right. What are some examples of some common foods that contain surprisingly high concentrations, concentrations of sugar? Well, I think the, the most surprising to me and one of my favorites is ketchup. Ketchup and barbecue sauce are uh, hugely full of sugar. Uh, things like soy sauce have sugar in them to augment the salty taste. So there's sugar in a lot of places. Uh, it's not just sugary sodas, and it's not just cookies and cakes. And so you really have to be a, an informed consumer and read labels to know what you're getting. Okay. Are there any other foods that have links to cancer? Uh, there are a few. Uh, bacon was all the rage, especially uh, when it was cooked over an open flame. Uh, barbecuing meats may change some of the proteins in, in red meats, especially into carcinogens. Uh, it, it is uh, uh, commonly linked to animal proteins and, and uh, diets high in unsaturated fats. And so there, there are lots of things that are postulated. Uh, the, the specific links are hard to prove because it's not just one thing. You can't say, I eat steak every day, I'm going to get cancer because you have all these other environmental and family history factors that contribute. All right. So let me ask a follow-on question to that. As a practical matter, and family history and genetic predispos predisposition aside, is there a practical way to live a carcinogen-free life? I think there are two approaches. I think a heart smart diet that's largely plant based and largely non red meat based helps you the best in all regards. Uh, and that can be done in uh, you know, pretty comfortably, I think, in the American diet trend. Uh, avoidance of excessive amounts of simple sugars, uh, avoidance of excessive amounts of alcohol, just the, the moderation mantra, I think, is the right approach. All right. So how much more research do you think is necessary with respect to sugar and cancer? Well, I think there's a, a lot of high-quality lab research that can continue to be done, but the problem remains trying to apply it to the population as a whole. Uh, and again, trying to, con to have a control group is nearly impossible. So it's all going to be looking back and looking at diet trends and population studies and, and trying to find a link and then trying to tease out 
you know, did they live next to Love Canal and have all the radon exposure? Mm -hmm. uh, so they would have to be eliminated in terms of a true nutritional impact study. Uh, it is hugely complicated. I'll put in a shameless plug for our new School of Community and Rural Health. Uh, that's the kind of thing they're going to be investigating in part is what's the impact of our diet, our behaviors, our environment in, in Northeast Texas on the health of our residents. And that's gonna be huge over the next few years. Well, so let me ask you this. What about those who have currently or have in the past battled cancer? Should they avoid sugar completely? They need to keep a healthy weight and exercise will not only help achieve that, but also seems to help most metabolic functions improve as well as combat depression and promote good sleep if done early enough in the day. So slimming down and getting active are two of the best things you can do to help keep your cancer that's been diagnosed from coming back. And then certainly stopping smoking if you're a smoker uh, will help for many, many types of cancers. All right, very well. Doctor, thank you for your time. You bet.